Now this one is a special dedicated to all the bicycle man, the man. Especially to a man, seven man gang. Welcome to Bike Life Radio from KWNK Studios and BikeWashow.org. We ride our bikes out into the world with a recorder and we talk to people about their bikes and lives. I'm Kai Plaskon. Right on. The League of American Bicyclists is starting a program to educate cities around the U.S. about how bikes and cars can coexist. Dames of Dirt has combined bikes and women's right to choose. We have the details on a record-breaking micromodal revolution underway. But first, international bike news. In London, computers tell humans what to do when making fold-up bikes for manufacturer Brompton. The company has 100 Raspberry Pis running its factory, scanning bikes and flashing lights at humans to help them meet time targets as they build these bikes. Eurobike is in Germany's financial capital for the first time. They're talking about the future a lot. Now cities can incentivize people to get on bikes by making streets safer. It's that simple. You incentivize people by making the streets safe and then they want to ride their bikes. Uh, Bike people love nerdy new bike things, right? Uh, Now there's a combination bike paddleboard. Yeah, it looks like a speedboat uh, with a bike on it. It's not really a, a bike because it doesn't have wheels. Anyway, to make things stranger, a car maker did this bike boat thing. Uh, check out Red Shark Bikes. In Buffalo, New York, if you want a driver's license, you have to take a pedestrian and bicycle safety course. What a concept. And it's important one since drivers kill a lot of walkers and bikers. Governor Kathy Hochul signed that into law. Among the hundreds of bike accidents each month, we always try to choose one that is particularly interesting. The jolly one-legged Benjamin Barefoot, yep, that's his real name, he's back on his bike five years after a semi-truck hit him. The expense, $10,000, costing him literally a leg, not an arm though. Uh, His return to the road on his bike made the news in Manchester, Indiana, chronicling his long road to recovery after being hit. Why did he get get back on his bike? Well, he wanted to finish the ride that he was on when he was so rudely interrupted by that semi-truck. You're listening to Bike Life Radio. Time for local Reno Sparks Tahoe bike news from BikeWashoe.org and Bike Life Radio. I'm Kai Plaskon. Right on. The city of Reno wants to know if bikes belong in downtown Reno. They have a survey on the future of downtown Reno. You can find the placemaking study link on our Bike Washo Facebook page. Tell them that Virginia Street bike path, well, it's fine, but that people need a permanent solution and they need to finish the well-studied Center Street cycle track so that there can be a uh, direct and permanent bike path from UNR through downtown to Midtown. A deadly intersection at Mill and Kitsky might get fixed. The bike path ends right now before the intersection. The RTC has a plan to widen Mill Street and continue the bike path, and they may build a protected lane there too. They're taking public comment. Go to millstreetwidening.com and tell them to put in protected lanes uh, to meet federal standards. Millstreetwidening.com. Sparks Boulevard has bike lanes that end abruptly, too. We like to say that the ending of a a bike lane uh, is like inviting people into a pit of alligators. You're like, hey, ride in this bike lane. It's nice and safe. And then suddenly it disappears. And oh, my God, there's a pit of alligators Uh, like cars. Uh, Anyway, on Sparks Boulevard, they're fixing the alligator pits, making bike lanes that actually continue through intersections. Also, bike lanes will be added in each direction at nearly every phase of the project. Uh, While these are are improvements, there is only one section that meets federal recommendations for bicycle safety and adds a protected barrier on a bike path. To be fair, there are some separated paths that will be improved too. If you want to tell them to put more protected paths on Sparks Boulevard, then call 775-789-9809 and tell them, put in protected paths. 
Bike infrastructure experts from around the world will descend on Reno in August and September. University of Nevada professor Tom Albright and the Truckee Meadows Bicycle Alliance uh, applied to bring the League of American Bicyclists to Reno for the new Bike Friendly America workshop. Reno beat 13 other cities and won the honor of hosting the experts on August 22nd and 23rd for the League of American Bicyclists. Also, the world-renowned Dutch Cycling Embassy is coming to Reno for three days in September 12th, 13th, and 14th. The Truckee Meadows Bike Alliance has raised $6,000, but needs to raise $16,000 to pay them to be here and help the city. You can help. Uh, go to bikewasho.org and sign up for one of the free events, and you can make a donation at the same time. Hey, bikes and women's right to choose go together. The Dames of Dirt raised thousands of dollars in July with a ride for reproductive rights. Money was donated to the Wild West Action Fund of Nevada. Want to put your bike muscles to work for a good cause? Write to damesofdirt at gmail.com. A protected bike path for kids at Reno High School isn't going to happen anytime soon. Councilman Devin Reese looked into it. Apparently, the street level was messed up near the curb, creating a dangerous situation that has to be fixed before major improvements can be made. So kids on bikes will be in danger for at least another three years, he says. The Truckee Meadows Bike Alliance will probably complain about this problem to the RTC. They always complain about bad things. They also say good things, too, about good things. Uh, it's like a balance or something. Anyway, that's it for Washoe County Bike News from BikeWashoe.org. I'm Kai Plaskon. Right on. Here's the big news. The League of American Bicyclists is coming to Reno with their Bike Friendly America workshop. This is new for them. Here's Anna Tang with the organization to talk about the goals. Yeah, we're so we're a national bike advocacy group and uh, we work with local advocates and communities on a bunch of different levels, businesses and universities to do bike advocacy. We have um, a bunch of different departments, but we have like our advocacy team, which I'm in, and we have the Bicycle Friendly America program, which includes bicycle friendly communities, businesses and universities. And then we also have an education program, which does youth, adult and everything in between education. And then we also have like a policy group and something else that we do uh, that I didn't mention yet is we have the National Bike Summit, which is the largest gathering of bike advocates in the country. And that's a really awesome event that really energizes advocates to like get out there and talk to their uh, representatives and like help help with advocacy and like different policies that get made. So do you have that coming up pretty soon? Um, not soon, but we are going to start planning for it very soon. It's always in March. It varies whether it's like at the beginning or at the end, just depending on like whatever is going on in the legislature. But uh, so March is when it always is. Yeah. So we usually have a theme and then we get RFPs like requests for proposals to like be a speaker at it. And I think it's pretty typical like RFP. Oh, okay. So I can't just send you a text. Probably not, but you, <laughs> you, can, you can text me and if people really want to text me, I'll talk to them. <laughs> okay. Excellent. So uh, you said that you work with advocates uh, and that would include us, right? So yep. are you coming to Reno or what are you going to do? Yeah. So this year, and one of the reasons why I was hired is to help put on these bicycle friendly community workshops. And they, the grant that we got to host the workshops was funded by GM, which is the car company, General Motors. And so we put the call out for a bunch of the cities that have GM facilities to apply to 
have us come and host us to do these workshops. And so Reno was one of the communities that applied and then got chosen. And so we're very excited to come out and work with you all. You had a great application and um, yeah, just like a, a lot, a lot of things to work on, it sounds like, but also have a great start with things. And so just sounds yeah. like a really incredible place. Yeah, and uh, lots and lots of opportunity. I want to ask really quick about uh, the General Motors role in this. I speculated last month on on the radio show that uh, a car company would be interested in sponsoring bicycle things because they care about people being safe too. Is that, uh, uh, there's got to be other reasons too. What can you, I guess. I think, you know, I, I want, because I've, what I can gather is they're just really interested in making the communities that they have their facilities in better for all of their employees and the communities that they serve within those places. And part of that is, you know, helping it to become more bicycle friendly because that helps to create a safer place for everybody who's using the streets. Ah, excellent. All right. So uh, Reno, I was, you know, counted the number of communities that had, um, that had the opportunity to apply. And that's not to say that they all did, but, uh, I think there were 18 that were listed and, uh, and I like to say we beat 13 other, uh, communities with our application. Not, uh, maybe they didn't even apply, but we can say we won, uh, one of five spots. So I'm really, uh, happy about that. Uh, yeah. so you're going to come here and then what's going to happen? Yeah. So Right now it's planned for two days and the workshop will be part like sitting down like in front of a projector and like sitting at a table and like talking and doing kind of like a conventional learning system. I'm making a presentation and we're going to go over like what is a bicycle friendly community? What does that look like? What are the components of it? And then with the people that you're helping to invite, like the city city engineers, planners, um, advocates sitting down and like having robust discussions about like what what does engineering and planning look like for Reno? What does encouragement programming look like? What equity initiatives are you doing? And going through like the series of five E criteria that we have uh, for bicycle friendly communities. And then we're going to actually do a bike ride and kind of bike around the city and just kind of do like an on street workshop where we can like rate, rate the conditions of the roads, like what would you improve and then take that audit and apply it to the five E's and then come up with an action plan that you would like to work on in the next year to like pick one thing to improve or work on or come up with whatever, whatever it is that your community wants to do. It can be pretty much anything. The sky's the limit, but it should be able to be achievable in 12 years, 12 months. Oh, fantastic. So that would be some, some rapid change. Have you done this in, in other communities and for, for how long, if so? Yeah, so this is actually the very first time we're doing it. Oh. So this is the first year. Um, in the past, some other league staff have done similar programs, but nothing exactly like this. So this will be the very first year that we're doing it and testing it out and, you know, figuring out what works and what doesn't work. But I have run um, similar things like this before, like campaign building and doing uh, like audits for communities. So I, I like to think that I, I know what's going on and I can I can offer my technical assistance. And honestly, at the end of the day, the people who live somewhere know the community the best. And so you're really the experts. And so like, I think what I can do is like help guide and steer you towards what's going to work for your community because I have seen like national examples and like, you know, read a lot and like worked with a lot of different people, but you know what would work best for your own community as far as like solutions. You're listening to Bike Life Radio on KWNK. Uh, yeah, it, we have this pilot pro project going on in downtown Reno right now. Have you have you heard of it? And, uh, do I need to kind you of could, a little bit about tell, it? Tell me about it. All right, well, so the, I, I don't know exactly how long it is and that's kind of a flaw, but uh, right through the downtown downtown Reno up until this year we had no bike paths so all the bike paths like stopped right before they got to downtown Reno and uh so uh, we you know we were very concerned about that as you can imagine and this year for the first time they put in what's called a pilot project um which is kind of a temporary bike path through downtown it goes right through right in front of the casinos right on the major thoroughfare of Reno, uh, you know, right through the middle of town on Virginia Street, and then there's a, a connection, a connection on Fifth 
that's a protected path. And, and all of these are protected paths. Um, and it probably goes for three, some maybe four miles, um, which is, you know, big for us to have a protected yeah, path. Yeah. Um, and, you know, while the city has called it a pilot project, there's this education element for the community. Like, you know, we know that this can work and we've seen it work throughout the world. Uh, these, you know, these systems that have been put in place. Um, but the, the community is just not, you know, all that sure about it. Like, I, I think we put some bike boxes in and they were like, what the hell is that? That's the stupidest idea ever. And, uh, and like, whoever came up with that? And, and so right. we had to respond to over a thousand messages on social media that, you know, wow. have been in media, been at the police department, been with the city. And, uh, you know, just trying to educate the community on what these things are and that we're yeah. not the first ones to see them. And so that community education element is, is it's like, a, it's not really a pilot project to see if the thing works. It's a pilot project to see if we can teach people about, uh, about what, what a bicycle is and what kinds of things the people who use them need. Right. Right. And so uh, how much of that is uh and and will there be some sort of like community like some advice in terms of how to engage the community on these things yeah definitely so you know something that i'm hoping you know we can take a look at and discuss when i'm there and like doing the workshop is talking about like the amount of people who don't have access to cars in the community and like dignity as far as like transportation and getting around for anybody and what that means and what that looks like and you know like how you're allocating the space of a street so like I, I forget what the exact statistics are for Reno but say like nationally there's about eight percent of the nation doesn't have access to a personal vehicle and so that's you know that's several million people who don't have access it, like eight percent that doesn't sound like a lot but when you put it into individual people that's like a ton. That's a lot of people who don't have it. So they need a way to get around. So if they're not, you know, using the sidewalk, you know, walking, rolling, biking, taking public transportation, you know, that's, that's how they're going to be getting around. And so they need to have a safe way to do that. And so this is thinking about how to allocate the street space so that these people and anybody else who is choosing to bike or, you know, do the, Specifically, we're going to focus on biking since that's like what our organization does. Um, like how, how to incorporate that fairly onto the street space and like where to do it. So, you know, it's like people in cars wouldn't, uh, who are driving, they might not, they wouldn't expect a road to just dead end, you know, but that is super common if you're biking. And it's also easy to like create a bike network, network because there's already all of the streets available for cars. So it's in a way it's like fairly easy to like think about it and grasp the concept, but then like actually planning about it, planning it and then talking to the community about it is a whole other, whole other thing. Yeah. I've been trying to explain that to, to people, the whole bike lane ending part and, and trying, trying out different ways of explaining that to people that it's, yeah. you know, uh, a bike lane ending is like inviting people into a pit of alligators or something, or, <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, you know, like you wouldn't build a road that falls off a cliff and cause nobody would want to use it. And, uh, and so <laughs> I'm trying, I'm trying out all different kinds of ways to try to explain this to people because they wonder, you know, Hey, why aren't people using the bike lanes? And uh, you know, they see it when it's there, but they don't see it when it's not. And they don't see it when it ends. And so um, I'm working on, how to bring that to, to the RTC's attention. And I think that a lot of engineers, that's a regional transportation commission locally. And I think that a lot of the, the traffic engineers understand that. Um, and then there's like a period of time that it takes, I, like you fix the problem and the bike path lane continues instead of going to a pit of alligators. And, uh, and then it takes time for people to realize that it's safe and they can use it. And there's a, that period of time when nobody's using it is concerning for a lot of people who are in cars and s scratching their heads and wondering, hey, why is there's all this space over there? Can we use it to, so I can not be in traffic? Like, yeah, like bike, bike lanes in general are pretty efficient. So, you know, and, and people who are in cars might, 
you know, be traveling and then like, you know, a couple people on bikes just like pass them. And so like, they're, they're pretty efficient at getting people to channel through and like the ways that they're going. So, Oh, that's why there's nobody in them is because they yeah. are going through and they, yeah. Mm -hmm. And they didn't get stuck in traffic like everybody yeah. else. All right. Okay. That's good. <laughs> I like that. Thanks. Um, Let's take a break. You're listening to Bike Life Radio on KWNK 97.7 FM. Ever been in the Netherlands? Well, the Netherlands will soon be in you, Reno. The Dutch Cycling Embassy is coming, and for a brief moment in time, September 12th, 13th, and 14th, we can imagine Reno like the Netherlands, the most bike-friendly place on earth where people can ride a bike without fear. You're invited to join one of the public events every night. Details at bikewasho.org. We're back with Anna Tang of the League of American Bicyclists talking about the new Bike Friendly America workshop coming to Reno August 22nd and 23rd. It's mainly for engineers to learn about the uh, uh, about how to make Reno bicycle friendly and come up with a plan. So uh, you haven't done this really in other communities. It hasn't been like a real uh, like concerted effort as broad as it is right now. And, and so you're expecting to learn too, I guess, huh? Definitely. Yeah. I mean, so we'll I, teach you. you're coming here so that you can participate in our event. Right. I'm just, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, every community that we're going to, the only like similar thing about everybody is that you all have a GM facility there. Otherwise you're all are like very different and have unique challenges. So like uh, learning about a community to me and like doing my background and research is just as important as like actually coming there and then getting to like ride around and like meet everybody who's taking part. So yeah, it'll be just as learning curve for me too. I've been kind of um, basing a lot of my work off of like our bicycle friendly community applications because like the goal of these is to get like communities to apply for our program so that they can become a bicycle friendly community kind of like um i think reno already is and so yeah, the, the picture uh that you can see right now behind me is one that i took uh where we do have a bicycle friendly community sign i don't really know what that means uh could you tell us yeah so our bicycle friendly community program means that a community like a city or a municipality is interested in getting a designation a community can apply for this program and it's a really robust application and um, like the government and or municipality or local government establishment works with like different people in the community like schools, health agencies, advocates, um, bike shops, you know, co-ops, like whoever makes sense and they apply and then they get scored on like their criteria if they have like policies and different things like that. And then um, they also get a survey. So the survey gets sent out to the public to hear like the perception of how a community is. And then we have a bunch of judges who will s help to score and review all the applications and then award a community. Like we have no, no award for some communities and then it goes honorable mention, bronze, silver, gold, platinum, diamond. Yeah, we're just as interested as in people who don't bike as people who do bike. You know, it doesn't feel comfortable for a driver to have someone on some other type of mobility device where they're not as protected nearby or that they have to pass or, you know, there's a lot of uncomfortableness uh, right. in terms of that. And so I guess that brings us to the other kind of point that I wanted to make and see if you had any thoughts on is that we've recently, um, you know, sorry to use the term micromodal a lot more and trying to shift away from just being bicycles to also advocating for uh, lots and lots of different things, the skateboard or scooters or, or e-bikes or whatever they happen to be, one wheels and 
mm -hmm. uh, things like that. Is that a challenge that the League of American Bicyclists face as well, you know, is, is trying to find, you know, hey, where's the line between this and that, or, or is there not? And uh, is, is that a challenge that, that you guys are facing? Uh, right now, I don't, I wouldn't say it's been a challenge. It's, it's looked different in, you know, different places like bigger cities, you know, have been dealing with it for a while. Now it's also just getting introduced into other cities for the very first time, but in general, it's nice to see it coming up because the more people who are just not in cars, it means like the more people who can help advocate for bike infrastructure, you know, like bike lanes, because most people who are on like not bikes, you know, still use the same infrastructure. And so it just helps to make the case for mm -hmm. like why side paths need to be created or, you know, slowing speed limits and just creating a more, a safer environment for everybody on the road. Yeah, uh, I, I've recently come across that that car companies are also getting into the bike making, you know, e-bike making um, world as well. And so, you know, a lot of I think that a lot of cyclists and people on other mo mobility devices have often, you know, kind of been at odds with with vehicles and, and car makers. But I, I think that that may be changing as uh, car makers are, are focusing, starting to focus more on, on making bikes themselves. Yeah, I think um, just like in general, a lot of car manufacturers have been really focusing, you know, on e-vehicles, like anything e kind of like. Uh, we're talking to Anna Tang from the League of American Bicyclists and uh, you're listening to KWNK um, and uh, Bike Life Radio. Uh, Anna with the League of American Bicyclists is going to come out to Reno because Reno won the Bicycle Friendly America Workshop. Uh, I think we're doing, what are we doing in August and uh, 22nd and 23rd, I think we settled on. Um, it's really kind of an exclusive group of real close decision makers that are going to be learning from this, this workshop and trying to improve and come up with a plan for an entire year. And then uh, we have uh, the Dutch Cycling Embassy, which will come. And I think that's going to be a much more public event with a, a lot more people. Uh, we have to do that because the, the League of American Bicyclists event is free for us, which is wonderful. Uh, and uh, it's sponsored by General Motors, so they're paying for it. But the, the Dutch Cycling Embassy one is going to cost $15,000 and we don't have very much money. So we have to get people to come and pay. Um, so is there anything else that you'd like to add about, uh, about this event coming up? You do have five other cities, right? What are those other five cities that are, that you're going to go to and turn into cycling cities? Yeah. So right now we're still confirming all of them, but they should be, you also, Reno is picked, Rochester, Flint, um, Grand Rapids and Kansas City. Huh. Wow. That's interesting. Uh, and how many applied? How many communities applied for this? We got 10 applications and around 15 applications that got started. 10 were submitted and then five got chosen. Uh, and, and being at the national level here and, you know, I've, I've seen a lot of, uh, you know, more people are out on bikes, you know, than I guess in the past. Was there like a lull before and then COVID hit and, and people were like, what the hell do I do? I know I'll ride my bike. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, there, there was like a air quote, like bike boom people talked about during COVID, you know, where there were like record number of people out on trails, biking, and just like getting out and doing things that they probably wouldn't have done if the pandemic hadn't happened because, you know, social distancing and like different norms of safety just popped up. Um, so so, so yeah. are you seeing a lot more interest then with the League of American Bicyclists or, or uh, what? Um... But like just anecdotally, because before I joined the league, I was a community organizer in the bike world. So I've been in the bike world for uh, almost a decade and it definitely seemed like there was more interest in biking during the pandemic and like a growing interest in general, like just over the last five years. Hmm. Again, you're listening to Bike Life Radio. We're talking to Anna Tang um, with the League of American Bicyclists about the Bicycle Friendly America Workshop, which is a, a new workshop coming to Reno and four other cities in the United States. Um, how many years are you going to do this, this program, do you think? Uh, right now, we're only funded for this year, but we're hoping 
that like through this year will show that there was, you know, there was double the amount of support for it, you know, than we were able to offer, you know, programming. So hopefully we'll be able to just keep doing it for years to come and, you know, develop it. And then like, hopefully just like create an even bigger program of possibly doing like advocates who can like, like we have a league certified instructor program. I'm not sure if you've heard of it, but people can become certified to teach biking and bike education. And so if we're able to like turn this workshop into something a little bit more robust and get some longevity to it, maybe turning, you know, people like yourself into advocates who could go out and also help the communities like in Nevada, you know, become bicycle friendly communities. Once you understand the ins and outs of like all the aspects that it takes to become a bicycle friendly community, but teach them how to build a bicycle friendly community. So like how to talk to their government and how to involve the advocates and like, listen, listen to the voices of the people who don't usually get heard. So, so you're not going to bring me some training wheels and be like, Hey, here's how you attach them to your bike. And right. On your way. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, we'll see you August 22nd and 23rd. Uh, in Reno, Nevada. And if there's anybody else that's out there that's an engineer and, uh, or, you know, somebody who's a, an engineer uh, that would like to or, or an advocate that would like to attend and, and uh, you yeah, know, anybody's welcome. Yeah, anybody's welcome. Uh, then, uh, you know, reach out to us at uh, the League of American Bicyclists, uh, uh, Anna Tang, or you can reach me, Kai Plascon, at the Truckee Meadows Bicycle Alliance. And so I really appreciate you uh, taking the time. I know that you know, we're all really busy. So thank you. Yeah. Thanks for inviting me. So the Dames of Dirt did a ride for reproductive rights, but they do a whole lot more than that. Uh, they, they did that ride in July, but you can still donate, of course, to um, uh, reproductive rights organizations. Aurora from the Dames of Dirt uh, met with me at Hub Coffee Roasters to talk about why, uh, what they do and why they do it. I run a mountain bike group called Dames of Dirt. We're an all-women's mountain bike group that tries to make mountain biking accessible to um women and women plus in our community. Yeah, we are, as a club, we're riding for reproductive rights in the month of July. And our goal is for people to pledge to ride a certain number of miles and to find um, individuals in their community who are willing to sponsor their miles. A dollar a mile is our goal. So we are, um, so far, we have actually raised $1,200. We're donating all of our funds um, split between the Wild West Access Fund, which is a Nevada abortion access fund, and the um, Access Reproductive Justice, which is an access fund in California. Can people still give money in August if they want to? Yes, absolutely. Really? Oh, yeah. Are you sure? <laughs> we're just ri- we're just counting our miles in July. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. So, uh, and you can donate any amount you want, right? Yeah, you can donate any amount you want. You can... Um, can you pretend that you rode like a thousand miles and donate that amount? Absolutely. Okay, I don't really yeah. care how many miles you actually <laughs> ride. <laughs> the, the goal is to raise funds to support women... Um, who are seeking reproductive health care in Nevada or coming from other states since we do have a lot of bordering states where access may not be as easy to get. And you made a really important point earlier that um, that Dames of Dirt is, uh, uh, Dames of Dirt and your members may not have trouble accessing um, reproductive rights and so uh, your, your goal is to, to help others, right? Yeah, our goal is really, I mean, in many ways, we feel really lucky to live in Nevada, in a state where um, reproductive rights and access to abortion care is written into our constitution. So to overturn that would be pretty challenging, would be a multi-year process. And at least for now, those rights are protected. And so we'd love to help women from other places who may be um, seeking to come to Nevada and um, and not just that but also women who maybe live in our state but might not have the access that's required maybe that means travel expenses you know they may live in the eastern part of the state or um, just not have the funds available to get the care that they need can you are, I'm not sure if you're really the right person to ask this question of and it's okay to say you know I don't know uh, but uh, do you are you able to put 
a dollar in perspective or a thousand dollars in perspective? Like what, what does that mean the difference between for someone who may be uh, facing a challenge with access? Yeah, I mean, I guess depending on um, the time in the pregnancy, but someone seeking an abortion generally spends around um, 700 to a thousand dollars without travel expenses, um, just getting health care. Um, and so if someone needed to travel, you know, that could double, triple hotel rooms, et cetera. It usually takes a day or two. Um, and you may have to take time off of work. So how can we make this easier and more accessible to people? All right, good. You knew the answer to that. I did not. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> and you do um, other things too besides Dames of Dirt, don't you? I do, yes. Yeah. So I'm, um, I'm a teacher. I teach high school earth science and physical science at Worcester High School. I, I mean with bikes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, I want to know about yeah, school. I know, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I also work for Skiing is Believing, which is a nonprofit um, aiming. No, not skiing either. No, I'm just but that's kidding. the name of our organization. But I'm a mountain bike coach at Sky Tavern. Okay, all right, um, all right, all right. For okay, Skiing no. is Believing, <laughs> we need to change our name because we're doing a lot of biking yeah, these days. Biking is for believing. Biking is believing. Yeah, yeah it's biking. Is <laughs> it believing. doesn't have quite the same ring to it, but <laughs> I disagree. This uh, let me just remind everybody: this is Bike Life Radio. Yeah. I'm going to remind you, especially Aurora. <laughs> Sorry, sorry. That's okay. That's okay. I'll I'm just kidding. I'll keep it bike related. <laughs> um, so I'm a mountain bike coach at Sky Tavern. We've got summer programs and fall programs for students um, and for kids and for adults also who are looking to learn how to mountain bike. We've got, um, we do provide scholarships. So if there's anyone who doesn't think that they uh, might be able to make it work, we're happy to work with people and try to find a way to make it happen for them. Um, we also have bikes that folks can borrow too. So it's a good way to get into mountain biking. We were speaking earlier about, uh, you had done a, a program in Sun Valley, right? Where you tried to improve access and it was a real challenge, wasn't it? Yeah, we um, we worked to create an after school program for mountain biking for middle school students in Sun Valley. And um, it was supposed to meet right at the school, and we had really low enrollment from students, even though we had a lot of engagement from teachers. And, and from you had a an, bus? And we had a bu an after school bus that where they could, a late bus that would take them home after. Um, but I mean, the major challenges in that community were students' responsibilities after school, and kind of, uh, I think it's just an unknown, like parents and families do not know what mountain biking is and don't see it as something that might be important or interesting for their kids um, and so you know we really have to rethink how we frame that and how we make it valuable um, to families in that community. That's impressive uh, Aurora because I got depressed when I heard that and you're not at all. <laughs> oh no I'm, <laughs> I'm a teacher so I <laughs> You find solutions, huh? Oh, yeah. If you let something like that deter you, um, you know, if you think creating access to communities who don't feel like access is available to them for biking, for outdoor recreation, um, it takes time. You have to build trust and you have to change your strategy to be culturally appropriate to what is they value in their lives. Is there anything else that you'd like to tell the, the public about Dames of Dirt? Or uh, uh, you're, you have 80 members, right? And you're looking official for... Official members. Yeah, we have 80 official members, although we have like 700 followers on Instagram wow. and another 400 on Facebook. So, um, no. yeah. No. <laughs> it's I, an exclusive opportunity. We no, have to... We have no, we oh, okay. 80 official members. And to be a member... There's no fee. It's just a club. We're a casual group of um, women and women plus who like to get together and bike. So we did a ride recently up on the Immigrant Trail. We did, um, there were three options. You could do like a quick loop that was just four miles. You could do a 20 miler. Or you could do a 10 miler. And at the end, um, we all got together and hung out at the trailhead up in Truckee. And we... Um, we also had a, a woman who's a physical therapist come and she chatted a little bit about some um, things that were helpful specifically for women, making sure you don't get injured and how to fit your bike to your body, which was really cool. Um, so we try to like bring in people from the community to help 
people understand uh, biking and it's great for beginners and it's great for intermediates and we got pro racers that are in our group too so kind of everybody coming together to make sure that there's a safe place for pe- women to bike together and to have a good time and laugh and uh, and challenge themselves. That a lot of times it's a little intimidating to ride with men because they they you know want to ride fast or something like that and um and I, I didn't realize that that was kind of an issue uh, sometimes. Right? I mean, I think it's, I wouldn't say all men are that way. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, some women are that way, too. And uh-huh. so yeah, I was intimidated. I rode with someone who was really, really good, who was a woman. And I was uh, and it was intimidating. You know, in some ways, <laughs> like I didn't feel like I was living up to my manliness. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, we're just trying to kind of challenge that structure of competitiveness within outdoor sports um, because for most people things like mountain biking are supposed to be fun uh-huh. and they're supposed to be a great way to get outside to reduce stress to build community so uh-huh. yeah, uh, speaking of the ride for reproductive rights you've uh, you've got some donors like uh, some some businesses right yeah. well, who are they so um, locals creative which is a a web design and marketing group in Truckee has um, said that they will match some of our miles, so that's really awesome. And RMU, which is a, they may, they're a small gear company, really small little company based out of Truckee as well. They have also pledged to uh, match some of our miles, so we're really thankful for that. Excellent. All right. Well, I'll, uh, I'll let you try and figure out how to make it easy for people to donate. And then we'll uh, go to Dames of Dirt. And by the time this airs, you'll have it figured out. Oh, yeah, definitely. Right. <laughs> Check us out on Facebook or Instagram. Feel free to join any of our group rides. You don't have to be an official member. Anyone is welcome. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, somebody's already messaging you about Dames of Dirt. That was Aurora with Dames of Dirt. If you want to get in touch with them, uh, write to damesofdirt at gmail. This is Bike Life Radio. The world hit a micromobility milestone this year. Bird electric scooters celebrated 100 million miles of rides. Here to talk about it and their relationship to bikes is Bird Bigwig Robert Singleton. So I am the uh, government partnerships manager for Bird, covering um, uh, a lot of the West Coast. So um, Rockies region, West Coast, and then all the way out to Honolulu. So um, I do from Honolulu to San Francisco, all the way to Reno, and then Denver. So basically the straight line of states and, and cities in that area. Awesome. And, and so recently, uh, you know, I, I guess it was a little more than a year ago, uh, we made an introduction, asked Bird to come to town and, and uh, then City Councilman uh, Devin Reese rode a scooter and then he was, uh, you know, in your corner the entire time uh, uh, getting pushing to get Bird in, in Reno. And now you've been here for a couple of months and, and just recently hit 100,000 rides, uh, 160,000 miles or something like that. Um, the, the 1.5 miles is pretty standard, right? For mo- most communities. Is that, is that correct? Or is it longer? Yeah. 1.4, 1.5 miles. So actually Reno is just a little bit higher than that. And then, uh, to your other points, we've now facilitated, um, as of today, 130,000 unique rides and over 200,000 miles in total trip distance. Wow. Holy cow. So the, the distance is increasing. Um, yeah, it's, uh, as people get more familiar with the program, we do start to see, um, people begin to rely on it more for, for rather than the short little trips for recreation, but actual, you know, to, to, use it as a meaningful transportation option. Uh Uh-huh. How is, so how would you say that Reno is different than other communities or are we exactly the same in terms of operation? No, I would say Reno, um, is doing much better than most of the communities. And, and this is really, um, more about Reno just uh, having a, a lot of demand for this sh- for shared mobility. You know, we see a ton of ridership, like some of the highest rides per day per vehicle of any market um, in, in Bird globally, but especially in North America. Um, we also see, uh, I would say, some of the tightest and most compliant operations um, in res- 
in regards to our local fleet managers. So I would say Reno has some of the best, most invested local fleet managers here who are very prompt to respond to issues and complaints um, and have just been able to run a, a really smooth smooth set of operations. Um, it's not to say that other cities don't, but I just say that the, the fleet managers we have in Reno are really top tier in terms of like their performance. And, you know, they, they are having a great time as, from, as far as I can tell um, doing this kind of work. So. Excellent. Yeah. I've seen them uh, driving around town in U-Haul trucks to pick up scooters and stuff, which is, is interesting. Uh, how, how does that work? Um, so we work primarily with uh, either existing companies um, or people who are looking to get into business. Um, and these are people who have access to either commercial storage or, or vehicles or, or are done longer term commercial leases and things like that. Um, but they're the ones who are uh, principally in charge of charging, uh, maintaining, uh, deploying and rebalancing our vehicles. You know, we really want to, to uh, work with the, our communities that, you know, that we serve to design a program that's going to meet their needs um, and be proactive in how we think, uh, how we think we're going to be, you know, if we're going to have to proactively address some kinds of, of issues or problems. Um, this is doing the, the outreach, the education, the working with the interest groups. Um, so not just, you know, the, the Bicycle Alliance, but also, you know, doing the proactive presentation to, um, you know, for instance, the seniors, the seniors committee, um, yeah. accessibility groups as well. Yes. Um, so, uh, and that, you know, all of that kind of direction, um, as well as, you know, the working with the, the city in particular to design, like, where should we have the, the parking for the vehicles? Um, that all takes um, a lot of back and forth, but, um, you know, ultimately, it's, it, that's how we build some of the, the stronger relationships. And that's ultimately, you know, the, the same core, like, thought leadership group that is, that is now weighing different elements of the program for the future, so. Well, I, I think it all comes down to, I think, a set of shared values. Um, so if we're, if we're truly committed to getting people out of their cars, we have to provide some kind of alternative. Um, and it's got to be, you know, both cost effective, but also, um, you know, it's got to make people feel safe. And so these investments and the infrastructure, in particular, separated bike lanes or having, you know, the, the designated spaces where people um, are are given the 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 space to feel safe um, is what's ultimately going to um, drive drive mode shift and drive better overall habits um, in terms of following the rules. Um, yeah, people on bikes and scooters not not necessarily following the rules. I would say that it's the same. It's for all modes. It's just some are more visible than others, or some that we've been more we've been more um, conditioned to kind of like accept. Um, so people miss park cars every day significantly, uh, I would say, you know, a lot more cars get misparked every day in the same service area because there's a lot more cars and a lot more people. Um, so I'm not necessarily saying that there's the same level of, of rule breaking. I would be interested to seeing some, some study around that. Um, we always try and encourage our, our riders through the education and app and through, um, through email and through kind of doing the direct community events and hopefully by coming on programs such as this to let people know the do's and don'ts of the road, uh, stay off those sidewalks. We're telling you, please. Um, uh, but you know, it's, it's, it's still like an ongoing effort, right? So, um, I guess it's a roundabout way of saying that, uh, you know, it's still coming back to the fact that we want to see the greater adoption of these vehicles. We want to see the mode shift and we want to respond to climate change in a way that is not going to, to hurt people's quality of lives, but providing them alternatives that still allow them to realize the benefits of having fast and easy and accessible transportation. I would say, um, well, I think we need, you know, more partnerships and more allies, I think is always going to be helpful. Um, I would say the vast majority of, of bike and pedestrian advocacy organizations um, are in favor of, of shared mobility and they do not see like scooters versus bikes. That's not the conversation that we need to be having. Um, I think the conversation we need to be having is, is meaningful transportation access beyond the car. So the car really is what we're competing against. And so, you know, I've seen cities, um, you know, I'll say one city in particular, um, Santa Cruz, where I had a conversation with um, a staffer who was worried about bringing scooters in the community because they were worried that it would compete with the bike share um, system that they're hoping to launch. And I, I was kind of at a loss to say like, you know, like, why are you worried about having yet more options for more people to get out of their cars? It shouldn't be uh, the bike competing against the scooter program. It should be what program are you hoping to design 
that has a mix of options that's going to better better incentivize people to to make that mode shift decision. So, um, you know, I think it's still uh, kind of a, a hurdle in terms of perception because you know, uh, and I would think that you know, like a, a lot of local government folks are are a little bit trepidatious about trying new things, and so scooters are still perceived to be kind of new, even though that we've now had five years of operating in 400 plus cities and we have pretty well defined best practices. You know, we've had new technology every single year. We've had more accurate geofences. We've had better onboard sensors. We've been able to develop parts that are both more resilient and cheaper to maintain. And so every single year we're making these major leaps and operationally in the, the back end system. So not only our bird AI, but the entire system for for making recommendations to fleet managers about where they should be deploying to get the most rides possible or uh, making sure that we have a checklist that's an actual checklist for here's what you have to do before you release a bird into the wild in terms of you know getting it out back on the street. All that stuff, um, we've made leaps and bounds. And so I think just addressing that awareness gap head on and say, you know, really what we're all trying to compete against is the automotive centric means of planning that has dominated American cities for the past 60 plus years. And so, um, you know, it's time for the new infrastructure. It's time for the reinvestment and the reimagining of, of how we get around. Excellent. Um, yeah, you know, that, that competition element, somebody recently pointed out that uh, by putting some scooters out there that uh, you're potentially reducing traffic for drivers. So that would be a reason why drivers might also support uh, seeing more more scooters on the road or or bike or share programs. One of the things I, I don't know if you've got any insight in this. Let me let me remind everybody that we're listening to Bike Life Radio and we're talking to Robert Singleton of Bird, uh, the electric scooter share company. Uh, I was in Sacramento recently and I was riding on a on a path that dead ended somewhere like at a freeway. It was nuts and I ended up on the freeway. It really totally sucked. I was on a bicycle uh, and. Uh, there were a ton of homeless camps all along the river uh, that, and that, that I saw. And uh, among them were many, many bicycle share bikes. And I don't remember what the company was that I saw, but they, uh, many had their front wheel removed, the one with the motor in it, uh, or their rear wheel removed. And then I saw wheels with the motor cut out of them. So the, the motors were being stolen to, uh, to recycle. And uh, what have you seen any problems with, like, I guess, technically with the scooters or, or challenges uh, to that extent, or just in general in, in the, the share? Um, um, I mean, we, we do see, you know, bad actors every, every so often. Um, and, you know, there are acts of vandalism or people who are, uh, you know, trying to get at certain parts. Um, you know, fortunately for us, the way we designed our modern, our modern scooters, and especially the Bird 3s, which are our latest and greatest that are in Reno, um, is that a lot of the, the parts that people would want to steal are either one of a kind or, or really built into the, the chassis of the vehicle. So you can't like steal the battery out of it and reuse that battery for something else unless you're like really technically proficient and, and largely like an engineer. So it doesn't actually, and plus it's, it's really hard to get open the chassis unless you have the specialized tools that our fleet managers do have. So the amount of like return on investment for the effort to steal uh, or vandalize the scooter is really not much, um, especially even people will go through and try and steal like the SIM cards, but the SIM cards don't work on anything other than the scooter. So if you do that once and realize it's not going to get you anything, there's almost no point in doing it another time. So while we do see isolated cases, um, you know, we've, this is part of our lessons learned, right? And being a company for about five years um, is we've learned how to design, um, you know, anti-theft into the, the chassis, the vehicle, so that it just, it doesn't make a lot of sense to want to steal these vehicles. Um, I think you see some of the older, the older vehicles and from, especially from either bike share operators or other operators where they, they're taking off the shelf vehicles from other companies and not designing their own. Um, you probably see that a lot more. Uh -huh. Huh. What would you say um, that is our biggest challenge in terms of infrastructure uh, and, and maybe some easy, uh, easy wins if there are any out there? It's really about achieving ubiquity, right? Is if I'm someone who is trying to become like a, a one car household um, or, or no car household, you know, what are the options that I'm going to be utilizing to get around the city? And can I depend on them? is can I depend on there to be a scooter within walking distance of me 
at any time if I'm in the service area in downtown Reno? And I would say right now, the answer is pretty much yes. And we've done a good job. Um, and I would say that, you know, as we begin looking at other parts of the city, uh, you know, whether it's potential expansion or going into neighboring communities, um, it's, it's all about getting to that level of ubiquity. Um, yes, there are going to be, every once in a while, there are going to be some scooters that people uh, misuse or, or leave blocking places they shouldn't. And it's up to us to respond to those in a timely manner and, and make sure that we're not allowing those isolated cases to detract from the larger benefits of 200,000 miles of carbon-free transportation that we've been able to create. Uh, again, this is Bike Life Radio, and we're talking to Robert Singleton of Bird. I know that you got to go here pretty soon, and so. Uh, but one of the things that we often like to do on Bike Life Radio is is talk to people about uh, their experiences on bikes, or in your case, it might be with a scooter or something like that—a personal experience, some some story that you like to to tell people. Do you have one uh, on a on a bike in particular? On a bike, um, so I mean. I'll tell you the reason why I, I joined the bird team. Um, so previously I was the executive director of the Santa Cruz County business council, which is a countywide uh, business association group. Um, we represent kind of the largest employers and I would be um, constantly driving around Santa Cruz um, to take these meetings and go meet with business owners. And um, when we first got bike share in our community, it, it fundamentally changed the way in which I got around um, and was what inspired me to want to participate in shared mobility programs because now I could get around the city um, uh, in a bike. So, you know, without having to take a car and, and, and burn carbon, um, I could do it with the electric assist. I wouldn't have to be sweaty. I could still wear my formal clothes and I can get up some of those, you know, particularly treacherous hills that we have in Santa Cruz in some areas um, make use of all the infrastructure that we as a community had invested in um, and ultimately have like a lot more fun doing it. Um, so like in Santa Cruz, uh, I don't know if you know, but in summertime when people are all coming from, you know, we are the Bay Area's beach, right? So we have got traffic coming from the entire San Francisco Bay Area coming down to warm, happy Santa Cruz, you know, having fun at the beach boardwalk, um, you know, going and enjoying our wonderful beer options. You know, I love living here. Uh, but it's a parking lot in terms of especially those weekend days where you used to have tons of cars, the traffic backed up all the way through the center of the city and all the way up into the highway. So to be able to get around, um, especially from a local's perspective, to make use of these back roads, the, 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 our river levee, um, the isolated green lanes that we have on Broadway. And, you know, now I can do it in record pace. I can have I know there's always going to be a bike near me, um, so I don't have to worry about bringing my own and getting it stolen or something like that, which, you know, can definitely be a deterrence for one to bring your own personal vehicle out. Um, so having that level of ubiquity is what inspired me to want to be part of the bird team. And so I think scooters do all that and more and are faster, quicker, better, cheaper and more approachable. And so I think they, these really are like the next step in, in urban mobility. All right. Do you have a message for uh, Carson City, Sparks, anywhere else? Um, you know, I, I think as more and more people become familiar with, with these systems and, and grow accustomed to using these vehicles, they're going to expect them more. And so if you're trying to get more tourists or if you're having local businesses who want to depend on having that increased traffic coming to and from their area, whether it's your scenic downtown or whether it's, you know, by the side of a lake where, you know, there's going to be a bunch of people who are going to be coming, coming and going the whole time. Let's get people out of their cars. Let's get a smile on their face and let's, you know, help support local business. Our, our program is, is, is in place for the next three years. So I think we can do well over a million miles. Um, since, okay. Since we wrapped that up, how many miles total has bird uh, like throughout the entire world uh, had, do you think? Uh, well, so we hit the hundred million mile uh, mark in February for globally. Wow. In February. Yeah. So oh, we're yeah. probably significantly over that by now. Um, I don't have the exact number off the top of my head, but um we, I can tell you that is um, we're breaking ridership records every single weekend right now. Um, you know, this is the first summer that people are able to come out of their house uh, minus COVID restrictions and feel really good about it. So people are traveling, uh, making use, uh, making use of these programs. And so we're just seeing, and the weather has been great so far this summer. Um, so we just, we're breaking records every weekend for the number of people who are deciding to use this type of transportation versus an automobile bird changing the world really fast one <laughs> community not fast not. enough <laughs> <laughs> all right well thanks for joining us i won't hold you here with more silly questions uh, but uh, thank you again for joining us and we'll talk to you again soon 
All right. Thanks, Kai. Appreciate right. it. Glad you seen Robert. Bye. That's it for Bike Life Radio. We record out in the world, never in a studio. Bike Life Radio is made possible by KWNK Studios in Reno, Nevada, owned and operated by the nonprofit bike shop Reno Bike Project. It's over on Grove Street. Uh, they got lots of parts and they'll help you fix your bike. It's amazing. I'm Kai Plaskon. Right on. <laughs>